Welcome to today's topic in the webinar series, Hypertension and Atrial Fibrillation, a Risky Couple, even more so when the family expands. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Aimone from Leiden University Medical Center, and she will present to you atrial fibrillation and COPD, shared pathways and implications for cardiovascular health. Dr. Nina Aishmona Marsan is cardiologist specialized in non-invasive cardiovascular imaging and highly involved in clinical research with a particular interest in improving risk stratification and management of patients with cardiovascular disease. The complex assessment of patients with COPD and AF is therefore of particular interest in this setting. She will share with us the increased risk for AF in COPD patients as well. Looking forward to your lecture, Nina. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Jeroen, and uh, welcome to everybody. It's indeed my great pleasure to contribute to this uh, webinar series. And uh, as Jeroen said, I will particularly focus on the risky association between atrial fibrillation and, uh, and COPD. And um, as you all know, COPD stays for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is a group of uh, progressive lung disease, which are characterized by obstruction of the uh, uh, airflow. And particularly, uh, there are two uh, most common forms that also correspond to the two clinical phenotypes that you see here nicely displayed by Netter many, many years ago which is the uh, chronic bronchitis and the emphysema. And both are actually uncurable disease, but uh, yes, uh, preventable and treatable, but less uncurable. And uh, uh, their global prevalence in the uh, general population range around 10%. Uh, however, if we look at patients with atrial fibrillation specifically, you see that the prevalence of COPD rise to 23%, so almost double what is in the global population. And if we see instead, as on the right side of the slide, uh, um, uh, how much is the risk of atrial fibrillation in COPD patients? This actually can be high to 30% increased of risk of atrial fibrillation, which goes actually uh, together with the more impaired pulmonary function, with more frequent exacerbation of COPD, and also with a more actually uh, structural remodeling of the heart and particularly left atrial dilatation. So the association COPD and atrial fibrillation is therefore clinically very, very relevant and actually known. And uh, um, association between atrial fibrillation and, uh, and COPD is probably explained by indeed shared pathways. And as you can see in this nice uh, picture, um, which was uh, in a recent state of the art review published in the European Journal, it showed that indeed this uh, shared pathway are due to some intrinsic characteristic of the COPD, such as, for example, systemic inflammation or uh, oxidative stress, but also to certain uh, really pathophysiological alteration that occur during COPD, which are also very arrhythmogenic and therefore can lead to atrial fibrillation. And as you can see indeed in this nice figure, can be hypoxemia, can be increased sympathetic activity, can be also pulmonary vascular constriction and therefore pulmonary hypertension that indeed are arrhythmogenic triggers. But very important, and uh, I will not uh, uh, stop highlighting it during the entire presentation, is also the presence of uh, uh, comorbidities. So uh, maybe if you can uh, uh, again highlight it for me. Yes, perfect. There are a lot of comorbidities that uh, um, are uh, indeed shared between COPD and atrial fibrillation, and then particularly uh, leads uh, to a structural remodeling of the heart, which favors, again, atrial fibrillation. And here, as you can see, our uh, hypertension, very important, obesity, sleep apnea, which is a sort of considered overlap syndrome with COPD, and of course, uh, coronary disease and heart failure. So um, if we go further, uh, one more slide, perfect. So this um, uh, this important uh, um, slide is to highlight that this association between COPD and uh, atrial fibrillation 
um, has important clinical implication. And in my opinion, the first one is really in the terms of screening and diagnosis. So as you can see in this, fly, in this slide, in patients with atrial fibrillation, we should screen for COPD as soon as the patient presents with uh, shortness of breath or exercise intolerant as the predominant symptoms. So as I suggested also in the review I was mentioned at the beginning, um, especially if the patient is older than 40 year old and a smoker, it is suggested to indeed uh, perform the screening either with the COPD diagnostic questionnaire or with a handheld microspirometry, which indeed is very easy to use and can uh, raise suspicion of COPD. In case those tests are uh, suggested for COPD, then we can eventually further uh, perform the gold standard spirometry. Obviously, if a patient with atrial fibrillation presents with these symptoms, we should also do a differential diagnosis with heart failure, particularly preserved ejection fraction heart failure. And most of these patients are also referred for an ECG echocardiography, and a lab test with the natriuretic peptides. So um, uh, it's also true other way around. So if we can uh, go further one more slide, we should screen also COPD patients for the presence uh, of atrial fibrillation. Um, so if a patient has COPD, we should do an accurate anamnesis to understand if there are also palpitation symptoms. And again, I will stress it again, the presence of comorbidities that makes the chance for atrial fibrillation even higher, such indeed arterial hypertension, coronary disease, and OSAS. And also particularly important is to monitor uh, the presence of maybe atrial ectopies because uh, these extrasystole are uh, one of the highest risk factor for developing later on atrial fibrillation. So some of these patients are actually um, uh, underwent, undergo uh, holter monitoring to really see the burden of, uh, of atrial ectopies and see eventually the risk of developing further atrial fibrillation. Other implication, important clinical implication also for the treatment. We know that COPD promotes IF progression. So if COPD patient gets a, a atrial fibrillation, this patient has more symptoms, more arterial hospitalization, and at the end also more mortality. So it's quite important to uh, optimize the treatment of COPD and avoid exacerbation, which are the trigger for new recurrence of atrial fibrillation. But here, of course, we would need more studies since no really clinical trials have demonstrated that uh, optimized COPD treatment can reduce in this patient the occurrence of atrial fibrillation. However, observational data have shown that uh, um, uh, COPD increases uh, the chance of recurrence of atrial fibrillation after cardioversion, that also the efficacy of uh, uh, catheter-based antiarrhythmic therapy, so ablation, are, is reduced in these patients, and also that in general physicians um, prescribe less beta blockers in uh, COPD patients with atrial fibrillation because, of course, are afraid of the side effect like uh, bronchoconstrictions. Therefore, uh, there are important, uh, indeed, uh, um, uh, treatment implications that should be taken into account. So if we go further, uh, one more slide. More implication for the treatment, uh, uh, and again here I highlighted once more, are also uh, the uh, need of identifying and proper treatment those comorbidities that make the chance for atrial fibrillation higher. And therefore hypertension again, so a good uh, regulation of the blood pressure is very important. Um, weight reduction uh, to indeed uh, uh, treat obesity is also very important, and the same for sleep apnea and coronary disease. And those, as I said, have important implication uh, for what we can uh, uh, consider the substrate of uh, the development of atrial fibrillation in COPD, which is actually the structural heart remodeling. If we go one uh, step further. You can see indeed highlighted that this is really the substrate for the development of atrial fibrillation. And first of all is, of course, atrial remodeling, which can lead also to mitral or tricuspid regurgitation, therefore valvular dysfunction, but also ventricular remodeling and increased pulmonary pressure. All very important indeed for the development of atrial fibrillation. If we go uh, one slide further, 
And finally, uh, the last really clinical implication are in the setting of the management, the general follow-up of these uh, patients. Um, indeed, these patients should be followed up uh, regularly and uh, uh, especially the um, uh, treatment uh, which we have been set either for the COPD or for the atrial fibrillation should be uh, effective. So we should see if that is uh, correct and, uh, and appropriate and if there are no side effects, as I said, indeed, regarding the uh, interrelationship of these two diseases. So it's actually a continuous reevaluation and continual referral between the cardiologist and the pulmonologist that should happen and eventually optimize uh, uh, one or the other disease. So uh, to kind of... Uh, uh, highlighted this aspect, I would like to also present you a case which we recently had uh, at our patient clinic of a man, 66 year old, who was a known and a smoker and with hypertension for which he uh, received a, a calcium antagonist uh, uh, treatment. Um, but for the rest, indeed, uh, no uh, known uh, uh, actually cardiac of lung diseases until now. But in the last day, at progressive uh, uh, palpitation and also shortness of breath, for which he was indeed actually uh, monitoring during his blood pressure measurements, and uh, he found indeed an irregular rhythm. And over the days, indeed, these uh, symptoms progress until indeed present uh, in the emergency room where uh, he was indeed uh, assessed uh, and at the uh, physical examination, they also find some bronchi. And this was CCCG, as you can see here on the right, which showed atrial fibrillation uh, with actually a relatively uh, not too fast uh, ventricular response and a, a right bundle branch block. Um, uh, this patient, uh, based on this assessment, of course, will start anticoagulation and some specific treatment, but was indeed correctly referred for an analysis of both the pulmonologist and of the cardiologist. And as you can see, the cardiologist perform an echo, uh, an echocardiography, and uh, uh, you have the images on the right. And as you can see, there is uh, uh, both uh, uh, dilatation of both atria, uh, which is pretty uncommon in this patient and should already uh, um, rise the suspicion indeed of comorbidities because especially the right atrium here on the left side of the screen is uh, uh, as much or maybe even more dilated than the left atrium. And as you can see in the lower palate, applying the color Doppler, there was already tricuspid regurgitation. So it suggests a long-standing problem and uh, more on the right side, so indeed with concomitant maybe uh, lung disease. And at the spirometry performed by the pulmonologist, there was indeed a significant COPD. So you can see that the phenotype of this patient is really specific. So if we go one uh, slide further, um, you can see, uh, uh, if you do one more slide, my conclusions, which I think I explain also through a clinical case that the diagnosis and treatment of patients with COPD and atrial fibrillation is really of crucial clinical importance, but is also quite challenging and, and really require a close interdisciplinary collaboration between the cardiologist and the pulmonologist, which should set up a good and structured follow-up. But also the patient is at the center of our attention and therefore patient education is also pivotal to improve the clinical outcome of these patients, particularly through a lifestyle management with all the essential points that I highlighted in these uh, figures and also home monitoring of all the other comorbidities that are uh, very important. So thank you very much uh, for the attention and I'm open for the discussion. Nina, thank you so much for this excellent, excellent presentation showing us how crucial it is that patients understand how lifetime management can contribute to improving their conditions. I have two particular questions that are coming up. How do you see the exact organization of this interdisciplinary collaboration between the cardiologist on the one hand and the lung physician on the other hand? And how can we improve patient compliance, adherence to therapy and follow-up? So basically two issues. How about the collaboration? interdisciplinary, and how do we improve patient compliance? Well, these are, of course, important points. Uh, um, for the collaboration, I think I 
made an example of this patient coming to, to our specific clinic where we actually set up a, a really what we call a dyspnea uh, outpatient clinic. So patient who presents uh, indeed with shortness of breath could be on one day we evaluated both by pulmonologists and uh, the cardiologists, which indeed try to understand the origin of these uh, symptoms. Of course, this is maybe even a step too far, but in general, um, it would be advisable uh, for hospital to treat these uh, diseases to uh, have uh, indeed a strict collaboration or really already a sort of pathway that the patient can follow to be in parallel analyzed by the uh, pulmonologists and by the cardiologists. And as I said, there are some characteristic risk factors of comorbidities that should particularly trigger our attention to the risk uh, of atrial fibrillation in these patients. And therefore, particularly these patients should be referred promptly and very early for both analysis of the lungs and of the heart. Yeah, so this goes in the direction of this, this integrated approach, yeah, where more specialties at the same time looking at the same patient and have to find a way to work together. And then the other one is the compliance, eh? Yeah, indeed, because of course we could put our effort, our specialist, but uh, actually the, the first step is to engage uh, the patient uh, in, in monitoring himself and, uh, and, uh, and see if the therapy and the other risk factors are well under control. So as I make the example of the patient uh, in my presentation, he actually almost diagnosed himself uh, while measuring the blood pressure and seeing that he had irregular rhythms together with his symptoms. Um, so that was really at the moment of the diagnosis. But afterwards, we should really um, stimulate our patient to uh, uh, monitor themselves. So if they have hypertension, to regularly measure it together with the rhythm. If they have, uh, for example, diabetes, the same for the, for the control of the glucose. Um, if they have, uh, are overweighted, of course, they should uh, follow specific diet and, and so on. And giving them uh, uh, tools at home uh, to monitor uh, these kind of parameters, engage them in being more compliant with the treatment and also uh, early uh, refer to his uh, GP or his specialist in case uh, uh, indeed the values are not well uh, under control. Right, and the other point that comes then diagnosis, <clears throat> which are the tests you think are crucial for diagnosis and what is needed for risk stratification? Well, as I try to highlight uh, uh, in the presentation, <clears throat> if we start with a COPD patient, if there are indeed uh, uh, palpitations, I think it would be very important to, uh, to perform at least uh, an ECG, but that will be one time, and unless it is, so it will uh, highlight some maybe possible structure abnormalities, but then indeed give him the um, uh, option of monitoring his, uh, his rhythm, uh, either performing a halter or giving an, uh, a way of doing it at home, uh, in order to depict if, for example, if there are frequent uh, ectopies or if there are moments of very regular uh, rhythm. If we have, of course, on the other hand, an atrial fibrillation patient, as has been suggested, those are normally referred to the cardiologist and therefore check, have an ECG or, or an echocardiogram and eventually a lab test, but could be indeed screened uh, for COPD very simply with a questionnaire of uh, an handheld uh, spirometry in order to indeed uh, um, uh, exclude the presence of COPD. And they could have maybe, as I said, this sort of overlap syndrome like uh, sleep apnea. And therefore now there are these specific watch pads that, that could uh, monitor also the apnea during uh, sleeping and could be a very good screening uh, for this kind of problem. Great, Nina. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, please join us on the 22nd of June when we will broadcast the topic of Professor Marcus van der Giet, extra members of the family, uh, pre-diabetes and chronic kidney disease, for viewing the recording of the live session which took place on the 15th of March. Please visit the e-learning platform Omron Academy. Thank you again. <laughs>